everyone. Welcome to Impact Christian Church Online. We're so glad that you joined us for our worship service this morning, our final worship service of the month of February. If you're watching us on Facebook, please like and share this broadcast so other friends and family can be blessed by it as well. Uh, we're just so thankful that you joined us. Hopefully you've brought your Bibles with you today. We'll be diving into Matthew chapter five in just a few minutes. And make sure you have some bread and juice handy if you'd like to join us at the end of the service for communion. And first, we're gonna spend a few minutes lifting up our voices in praise to our awesome God. Please join us.
of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain. The sin of the world, his blood breaks the chains. And every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before him. Oh, 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 oh. One, two, three. Whoa. you pray with me heavenly father we thank you for this morning we thank you for giving us jesus christ to to pay the price for our sins and pave a way for us to have a relationship with you uh, lord jesus we just pray that you would speak to us today through your word and we pray that you would open our minds and hearts to what you want to teach us thank you for the mouths you give us to praise you thank you for the minds and hearts you give us to receive your word and uh, to be able to apply it to our lives and we thank you for always being better to us than we have ever been to you. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 
Well, we are so glad that you joined us today. Today is actually Decision Sunday here at Impact uh, at our in-person services this morning. We were so excited to have several that made the decision to get baptized. Uh, we have others that are thinking about becoming members of Impact Christian Church. So if you're joining us online today, it's a great day for you to make a decision as well. If you'd like to get baptized, just reach out to one of our prayer and decision counselors. Their phone number will be on the screen for you during the service. You can call or text them. Or if you are a baptized believer and follower of Christ who wants to make impact your church home, we'd love to talk to you about becoming a member of Impact Christian Church. Uh, just this last week, we got our new yard signs in that look like, ta-da, this. So these uh, plug both our in-person and our online services. If you would like a yard sign uh, with a little holder post to go in your front yard, uh, just let us know at the church office. We'd love to get one to you. It's a great way to let neighbors and people passing by know about our impact online and in-person services. And so just let us know if you'd like to receive one. If there's any prayer needs that you have that you'd like us to lift up at our prayer meeting on Monday nights, uh, also reach out to the office uh, tomorrow morning. We'd love to be able to get those to our prayer warriors to lift up for you in the next 24 hours. And uh, we're just happy to help however we can. Just reach out to us and let us know. Finally, uh, if you are a supporter of Impact Christian Church with your tithes and offerings, uh, thank you uh, for faithfully giving to the Lord through Impact. Uh, you can give in one of three ways, whichever one you prefer. Uh, you could give by text, you could give online at our website, or you can simply write a check and mail it to our PO Box number. Thank you so much for supporting the great work of Impact Christian Church. And with that, please make sure you have your Bibles in hand as we dive into God's Word today. Today we are continuing our study of the greatest sermon of all time, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. We're in Matthew chapter 5, and just a few moments we'll be starting in verse 31. I want to just dive right into this message today. It's a really important and very relevant message. Make sure you've got your thinking caps on. Uh, make sure you approach this message with a soft heart and an open mind because what Jesus is going to teach us today is really countercultural. This whole sermon is countercultural, but especially uh, this passage today. It runs counter to a lot of uh, our, our, our thoughts in our culture today about how things should be in our relationships, especially in our marriages. And this particular teaching of Jesus even goes against uh, many of the laws that we have our, on our books in the United States of America. And so it is very countercultural, and this one is going to hit close to home for some of us in particular. So please make sure that you uh, receive it with an open mind and an open heart, and God is going to speak to us today. Amen? Today's message is called Raising the Bar, Divorce and Dishonesty. So we're in Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 31. Say amen if you're there. Amen. Here we are, Matthew 5, starting in verse 31. It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for marital unfaithfulness, causes her to become an adulteress, and anyone who marries the divorced woman commits adultery. Well, earlier in verses 17 through 20, Jesus tackled two big misunderstandings. Uh, the people had in his day as they were there on the side of the mountain listening to him deliver the Sermon on the Mount. The first misunderstanding, we've talked about this over the last couple weeks, was that uh, Jesus had come to abolish the Old Testament. People thought he'd come to scrap the Old Testament, and Jesus makes it clear there in verses 17 through 19, uh, no, I didn't, quite the opposite. I came to lift up and even fulfill the Old Testament. And then the second misunderstanding that Jesus tackled in verse 20 here in Matthew chapter 5 was this. Uh, people in his day believed that being a follower of God would make you look like a Pharisee. They believed the best followers of God looked like the Pharisees. And Jesus kind of burst their bubble and points out in verse 20, he says, I tell you the truth that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. So he basically says, if you live like a Pharisee, you ain't going to make it. 
And that was really, really a, a shocking thing for them to hear in Jesus' day. Here in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus makes it clear that Phariseeism, remember what that is, shallow, very flashy, very superficial, hypocritical religion. Jesus says this Phariseeism will never get you into the kingdom of heaven. Phariseeism might look a lot like Christianity on the outside to the casual observer, but remember, God doesn't look at the outward appearance. He primarily looks inside. He looks at the heart. So he sees Phariseeism for what it really is. It's me-centered, not God-centered. It's dressed to impress people, not lived out to glorify Christ. Pharisees look great on the outside, but they're corrupt on the inside because they haven't truly repented and surrendered their lives to Jesus Christ. So Jesus wasn't anti-Old Testament. He wasn't anti-Old Testament. He was anti-Phariseeism. He was anti-shallow, showy, flashy, hypocritical, me-centered religion. And because he believed it was so important to draw a clear distinction between Christianity and Phariseeism, Jesus spends the rest of Matthew chapter 5 giving us six examples of how Christianity is quite a bit different than Phariseeism. He raises the bar and shows us how Christianity is much, much higher and much deeper than Phariseeism ever was. Last Sunday, we looked at the first two examples in verses 21 through 30. Jesus addressed the sixth commandment, thou shalt not murder, and the seventh commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. And long story short, he made it clear that when it comes to obeying these two commands, Phariseeism won't cut it. The Pharisees taught that the sixth commandment was just about avoiding physical murder, but remember Jesus raises the bar. He makes it clear that the sixth commandment isn't just about avoiding physical murder. It's not okay to harbor anger and resentment and unforgiveness towards someone. To God, that is heart murder because we harbor that anger and resentment and unforgiveness in our hearts. And it's not okay to spew hateful words and slander at someone. We might call that mouth murder. And Jesus raises the bar by dealing with the root of murder in our hearts. The Pharisees also taught that the seventh commandment was just about avoiding physical adultery. And Jesus once again raises the bar. He makes it clear that the seventh commandment isn't just about avoiding physical adultery. It's also about avoiding lust in our hearts because adultery always begins with lust in the heart. Lust is the root of all adultery, so Jesus raises the bar by dealing with the root. Now, we just read verses 31 and 32 as Jesus dives into his third example of how God's standards are so much higher than the Pharisees' standards. He raises the spiritual bar addressing, in this third example, divorce. Now, the Old Testament law that Jesus alludes to here is the law in Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 1 through 4. So I'd like you to turn there in your Bibles. Deuteronomy is the fifth book in the Old Testament, fifth book in your Bible. Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 1 through 4. I want you to see for yourself what God's Word really says. And then we'll take a look at how Pharisees and teachers of the law twisted it and corrupted it. So here we are, Deuteronomy chapter 24, starting in verse 1. It says, If a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him because she, he finds something indecent about her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her, and sends her from his house, and if after she leaves his house she becomes the wife of another man, and her second husband dislikes her, and writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her, and sends her from his house, or if he dies, then her first husband who divorced her is not allowed to marry her again after she has been defiled. That would be detestable in the eyes of the Lord. Do not bring sin upon the land of the Lord, the land your Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance." So what law does God give the Jewish people there in Deuteronomy chapter 24? It boils down to this. A divorced woman must never remarry her first husband after being married to another man. We ask the question, why not? 
because she has been defiled by her second husband, which is detestable in the eyes of the Lord. Now, if that seems a little confusing to you, don't worry. Jesus will explain it to us. So, God's Old Testament law boils down to this. A divorced woman must never remarry her first husband after being married to another man because she is, according to God's word, defiled. But guess how the Pharisees and teachers of the law interpreted this passage? That was God's law. Here was the Pharisees' law. God approves of divorce, at least when it's the husband's idea. That was how they interpreted Deuteronomy 24. They taught the Israelite men that there were all sorts of legitimate reasons for a husband to divorce their wives. Now, ladies, think about this for a moment. See how you might enjoy living in ancient Israel or not even ancient Israel, Israel in Jesus' day. The, The rabbis taught that if a husband, your husband, didn't like the way that you cooked and you kept burning the toast, your husband could divorce you. Wouldn't that be lovely? Or if time went by and your lovely hourglass figure became more like a pear, your husband could say, I'm not attracted to her anymore. He could divorce you. Or if he simply found another woman that he thought was prettier and would make a better wife than you, he could divorce you. All of those, according to the Pharisees, were acceptable reasons for a Jewish man to divorce his wife. And Jesus says, not so fast. I don't think so. In verse 32, look again at what he says there in Matthew 5. He says, I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for marital unfaithfulness, causes her to become an adulteress. And anyone who marries the divorced woman commits adultery. Now, is Jesus saying what we think he is saying? Is he actually saying that some wives who are having sex with their husbands are committing adultery with their husbands? Yes, he is. Is he actually saying that some husbands who are having sex with their wives are actually having adultery with their wives? Yes, he is. Well, how is that even possible? It's possible because this third example of Jesus' higher standard is actually piggybacking off of his second example where he dealt with adultery. Don't miss this. Jesus raising the bar with adultery goes hand in hand with him raising the bar with divorce. Long story short, the Pharisees believe that they were obeying the seventh commandment flawlessly. They were convinced that they did not commit adultery, but Jesus reveals in verse 28, remember we talked about this last week, he reveals in verse 28 that they were adulterers in their hearts because of their lust. And here in verse 32, he reveals that they were actually adulterers with their bodies because as they had sex with their new wives, they were cheating on their old wives who they didn't have God's permission to divorce in the first place. Are you with me? Bottom line, their divorce papers were meaningless to God. Think about that. Their divorce papers were meaningless to God. It's not legal paperwork that makes a divorce legitimate. It's God himself. Did you catch that? Divorce papers don't make a divorce legitimate if God doesn't sanction it. And God was not sanctioning their divorces. In fact, as we read in Malachi 2.16, God hates divorce. John MacArthur does a really good job summarizing what Jesus is saying. Listen to these powerful words. He writes, the point is this. It was so easy for Jewish men to get a divorce that they didn't need to commit adultery. All they had to do was divorce their wife for any reason, whatever, do a little paperwork, and they could have any kind of relationship they wanted with somebody else. They could shed their wife so fast and marry the one that they wanted. The Pharisees were saying, we don't commit adultery. And Jesus responded, yes, you do, in your heart and by your divorces on the other than divine reasons, other than God-allowed reasons. 
You're proliferating adultery all over the place by unloading your wives indiscriminately. Every time you turn your wife loose, every time a divorce occurs, uh, you force her into adultery, which makes you guilty of adultery. Guilty of adultery. Whoever marries her is guilty of adultery. Whoever marries you is guilty of adultery. You've got adultery all over the place. Jesus is ripping off the mask of their self-righteousness to reveal their real hearts. And the whole point here is that divorce leads to adultery. It is just sequential. Divorce leads to adultery. That's what Jesus is saying. So, that's what Jesus is saying here. Jesus gives an expanded version of his teaching on divorce in Matthew chapter 19, verses 3 through 9. I'd like you to turn there in your Bibles with, you, with me. I, he just gives two verses of explanation here in the Sermon on the Mount, but he expands on this in Matthew 19, starting in verse 3. And this is what Jesus tells his critics and his followers in Matthew 19. It says, some Pharisees came to him to test him. They asked him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Haven't you read, Jesus replied, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female and said, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So they're no longer two but one. Therefore what God has joined together, let man not separate. Why then, they asked, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for marital unfaithfulness and marries another woman commits adultery. So here in this passage, Jesus takes his listeners all the way back to Genesis chapter 2 which is the point at which God created the very first marriage. He takes them back to Genesis 2, and he reminds them, and he reminds us, that God's original design and plan for marriage was one man married to one woman for life. For life. God would seal their wedding vows, and nothing short of death was to tear those two apart. Do you remember what the Old Testament punishment for adultery was? If someone committed adultery, they would just be rocked to sleep, right? They were stoned to death. The capital punishment uh, sentence was, was handed down to those who committed adultery. And so the punishment was death. And we asked the question, well, that sounds kind of harsh. Why was the punishment death? It's because marriage is a physical union between a man and a woman. It's a physical union. And adultery breaks that physical union. So Jesus points out that in the Old Testament, and I don't want you to miss this, in the Old Testament, divorce was a concession. It was a concession by God. In other words, if a husband was unwilling to have his wife killed because of her adultery, God allowed him to divorce her instead. It was, in a sense, an act of mercy. But like we do so often, we have taken an act of mercy and twisted it into an act of selfishness and sin. Think about that. Divorce was allowed in order to spare the adulterer's life. It was an act of mercy in many ways, but we have twisted that and we have corrupted it and we have made it into something selfish and self-serving. Jesus gives us only one legitimate God-allowed reason for a divorce, adultery. And only one other legitimate reason for divorce is given in the New Testament. We don't have time to get into this today, but you can turn and look at it on your own. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 7 through 17. Paul points out that if a Christian woman is married to a non-Christian man and that non-Christian husband says to his Christian wife, uh, I, I'm out of here, and he abandons her, he walks out the door and does not come back, he in essence is saying, I want nothing to do with you or your silly God, and he abandons her. Paul says in that situation, she is not bound to him, which bound was a legal term in that Greek language. And so we believe that means she is free to divorce him, 
but it's a little unclear in that passage if she is given permission to remarry someone else. And so the only, well, I should say it this way, the clearest exception uh, to the, the, the clearest uh, you know, guideline given in the New Testament for divorce is given by Jesus and it's marital unfaithfulness, adultery. And then the second one there in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 is abandonment by a non-Christian spouse, but that one is a little bit uh, less clear than the one Jesus gave. And so there are many questions that we don't have time to answer today. Uh, you know, what if my husband is an absolute jerk? You know, uh, what if my wife is an addict? Uh, uh, what if my husband is in the clink? Uh, what if I don't love her anymore? You know, we have all these questions. We can't tackle them all today. Uh, but I believe Jesus has given us in this passage what he wants you and me to hear today. He has given us what he wants us to hear today. I just want to say one last thing before we move on to Jesus' fourth example of how God's standards are so much higher than the Pharisee standards. Last thing I want to say on divorce is many uh, Christians, especially Christian women, want to know, what if there is physical or sexual abuse in my marriage? And I just want to tell you as plainly as I can, as directly as I can, if there is physical or sexual abuse in your marriage, you need to get out. You need to separate from your husband as soon as possible. But please don't make the mistake that many Christian men and women make, assuming that separation is just one small step away from divorce. And if you're separated, that is the next, na next natural step to go ahead and get divorced. That's not true if you're a Christian. Now, once you're at a safe distance from the one that is carrying out any sort of abuse, God may lead you to work on your marriage from a safe distance. But the main thing is you got to separate as soon as possible because if you or your kid's health is in jeopardy, you got to make sure that you guys are safe. Amen? Amen. Well, let's move on to Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 33, as Jesus gives the fourth example of God's higher standards, and he's going to tackle honesty and truthfulness, starting in verse 33. He says, Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, Do not break your oath, but keep the oaths that you have made to the Lord. But I tell you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. Simply let your yes be yes, and your no, no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. I'd like us to, to look at this familiar teaching in a, a fresh way. I, I like how Eugene Peterson, uh, in the message paraphrase, uh, shares these verses. Here's how he paraphrases them. He says, don't say anything you don't mean. This counsel is embedded deep in our traditions. You only make things worse when you lay down a smokescreen of pious talk, saying, I'll pray for you and never doing it, or saying, a God be with you and not meaning it. You don't make your words true by embellishing them with religious lace in making your speech sound more religious, it becomes less true. Just say yes and no. When you manipulate words to get your own way, you go wrong. That's pretty well said. Remember that Phariseeism is all about looking good on the outside to impress people. So guess what the Jewish uh, teachers' oaths were all about? You guessed it. They were all about impressing people. Those oaths were not in order to honor God. Those oaths were to make themselves look good in front of people. And so remember what Jesus in Matthew 23 says to the Pharisees and teachers of the law. We talked about it a week or two ago. Jesus gives seven woes. He really lays into them just a couple days before he went to the cross. In Matthew 23, 5, Jesus points out that everything the religious leaders did was for men to see. And in verses 16 through 22, Jesus points out how hypocritical their oaths and their swearing were. This was one of the seven woes that he, he laid down on them. So listen to an excerpt from that here. Matthew 23, verses 16 through 19, Jesus says, Woe to you blind guides! You say, if anyone swears by the temple, it means nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is bound by his oath. You blind fools, which is greater, the gold 
or the temple that makes the gold sacred. You also say if anyone swears by the altar, it means nothing. But if anyone swears by the gift on it, he is bound by his oath. You blind men, which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? Uh, Jesus just really lays into him here. He had good reason to be upset by the religious leaders' oaths and swearing. They had developed this ridiculous list of nauseating rules about which oaths were binding and which ones weren't, uh, what promises you needed to keep and which promises you didn't need to keep. It was just all nauseating. Uh, Jesus uh, basically says, what are you guys doing? You're supposed to be religious leaders and you're acting like second graders at recess. I remember when you were in grade school, particularly in, in primary, and, and you know, you go out to the recess, and some kid would say something, and, and the other kid didn't believe him, and so he, he'd say, cross my heart, hope to die, stick a needle in my eye. And then his friend calls him on it a week later because he doesn't follow through on what he said, and he says, well, I didn't really promise because my fingers were crossed. <laughs> it's pretty much how it was with the Pharisees back then, Right? Uh, they were, their fingers were crossed. If I say this, I don't have to keep my promise. If I say that, I do. It was all just absolute nonsense. So here in Matthew 5, 33 through 37, Jesus gives this fourth example of the clear difference between the righteousness of Phariseeism and the righteousness that God seeks. And just to be clear, Jesus isn't outlawing oaths and promises in a court of law. If you and I go into a court of law and we're asked to swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, guess what Jesus wants us to do? He wants us to swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. He's not talking about being in a court of law here and, and making an oath to tell the truth. What Jesus is talking about here are flippant, casual, and hypocritical oaths and promises, some we keep and some we don't. To borrow Eugene Peterson's words, Jesus is scolding us for manipulating words to get our own way. For, uh, for the follower of Christ, there should be no difference between our truthfulness from conversation to conversation. What I mean by that is, I should be no less truthful to a stranger on the street than I am to my wife at home. I should be no less truthful to the checkout lady at Target than I am to you at church. I should be no less truthful to the cop who pulls me over. Uh-oh, now we're hitting close to home. <laughs> I should be no less truthful to the cop who pulls me over than I am to my kids at their school. We should be telling the truth every time, all the time. Jesus Christ is raising the bar, calling us to be honest at all times, saying what we mean and meaning what we say. No embellishing, no half-truths, no white lies, simple, untainted honesty. But here's the thing. Jesus isn't just raising the bar a little bit, is he? He's raising it a lot. He's teaching us to be more than just truthful. When he tells us to simply let your yes be yes and your no, no, he is also telling us to be reliable. That's what he's teaching in this passage. If you say you're going to be there at 8 o'clock, Jesus wants you to be there at 8 o'clock. If you say you're going to pay him back next Saturday, Jesus wants you to pay him back next Saturday. If you say you're going to pray for her, Jesus wants you to pray for her. And I encourage you to pray for her now so you don't have the chance of forgetting. Pray for her now. If you say you're going to call him back in 20 minutes, call him back in 20 minutes. If you say you're going to finish the chore today, finish the dang chore today. Say what you mean and mean what you say. Finish what you started. If you start by opening your mouth and saying you're going to do something, then you need to finish by doing what you said you're going to do. Say what you mean, mean what you say. Simply let your yes be yes and your no be, be no. As Christ's followers, we're called to this higher standard. Jesus expects us to be honest and dependable. James teaches us in James 4, verses 13 through 15, when we aren't absolutely sure that we can follow through on something tomorrow or next week, because I'm not even guaranteed I'm going to be alive tomorrow or next week. You know, God holds the future in our hands, not me. 
And so James encourages us not to promise something that we may not be able to keep. He says we should say, if it is the Lord's will, we will do this or do that. It's a good habit to get into. Say, if it's the Lord's will, I'll, I'll be there on, on Saturday. Or you could say it this way, I plan to be there on Saturday, or I'll try to be there on Saturday, or I'll do my best to be there on Saturday. Just make sure when you say that, you truly do plan on being there on Saturday. You truly are trying to be there, and you will do everything in your power to show up. And if you're not able to make it for some reason, you let that person know that you made the commitment to. You, you let them know as soon as possible, so they're not twiddling their thumbs waiting for you to show up and wondering if you lied to them and never intended to come. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Well, as we consider these third and fourth examples of Jesus' higher level of righteousness, it boils down to this. Jesus Christ calls us to be honest and dependable in all our relationships, especially in our marriages. If you are married, you stood before God and a certain number of witnesses on your wedding day, and you promised that you would do certain things. Jesus says, keep your word. You said that you were going to be honest and true and faithful for richer, for poorer, for better, for worse, in sickness and in health. And Jesus says, I expect you to keep that promise. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Jesus Christ expects us to keep our word. He expects us to keep our commitments. He expects us to be reliable. He expects us to be dependable. And with his help and his grace, we can be all of those things. Lord Jesus, thank you for never raising the bar and saying to us, good luck with that. Lord, you raise the bar, but you are right with us every step of the way to help us be successful in rising to the challenge. Thank you, Lord. Lord, for some of us, this hits close to home. We realize we messed up in our last marriage. Some of us are wondering, is my current marriage right with you? And we're wrestling with that, oh God. I just pray that you would speak to each of us through your word and help us, Lord, to glorify you where we are today. We cannot go back and change how we goofed up yesterday, but help us to be faithful to your word and to your commands today. I pray for marriages that are struggling right now. Lord, give my Christian brothers and sisters stamina in their marriages. Help them to be dependable. Help them to be reliable. Help them to keep their commitments they made and to be honest every step of the way. And if they're married, Lord, to a spouse who does not love you and serve you, I pray that you would change that spouse's heart so these two could truly be on the same page as husband and wife, both loving you as Lord and Savior together. And Lord, I pray for every single one of us, regardless of whether we're married or, or single or, or divorced or, or widowed, Help us, Lord, to carry out these principles in every area of our lives and in every relationship we're in. Help us to be honest. Help us to be reliable. Help us to be dependable. And help us to keep the commitments we've made so that we can make you look better and better every day because people need you more than anything else in the world. And it's in your name I pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, once again, today is Decision Sunday. Maybe you're listening to this broadcast today and you aren't sure if you'd go to heaven if you died today. You've never really made a conscious, uh, clear decision to follow Christ as your Savior and as the Lord of your life. I just want to share with you today, if you're ready to accept him, A, admit that you're a sinner and need Jesus. B, believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins. And C, choose to follow him today from this point forward. Turn from your sin and start following Jesus. Put him in the driver's seat of your life. Reach out to one of our prayer and decision counselors right now. You can call or text them. Let them know you want to start following Christ today and they'd love to talk with you 
about how you can be baptized as soon as possible. You can come to the church or we can bring the baptistry to you. We want to help you get baptized to show the world you're serious about following Jesus Christ from now on. Maybe you are a baptized Christian and you just want to become a member of Impact or maybe you just want to rededicate your life. Whatever that decision may be, you can reach out to us as well right now. We'd love to talk to you about that commitment you want to make today. Whatever decision it is you have, make that decision. Don't drag your feet. This life is far too short to drag our feet when it comes to following Jesus Christ. Let's make some decisions today to follow him better than ever. And for those of you who are believers and followers of Christ who would like to take communion with us, I encourage you to take out the bread and the juice. I love Jesus. Jesus has been so good to me, so much better to me than I've been to him. His grace and his mercy is unspeakable, and I plan on spending the rest of my life here on earth and all of eternity singing the praises of my Lord Jesus. He gave us this bread to remind us of his body that was broken. Let's search our hearts and our minds right now, confessing any sin in our lives to him. If you goofed up this last week, you confess your sin to him right now. Say, Lord Jesus, please forgive me for, and you fill in the blank. Let's take of that bread, reminding us of his body that was broken for us to forgive our sins. And let's take of the juice together that reminds us of his blood that was poured out to forgive our sins. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Please forgive me. Please wash me clean by your mercy and grace and help me to follow you better this week than I did last week. Help me to be honest. Help me to be reliable. Help me, O oh Lord, to be dependable for you and for those in my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, we're so glad you joined us in worship today. Once again, you reach out to one of our decision counselors if you have a decision to make. You have an awesome week serving our Lord, and let's lift up one final song in our service together. God bless you.
Gotta be like Joel Olstein the whole time. <laughs> All right.